start our day, we wanted to focus on the overall conditions and future for the Cal Southern California safety net. I have a great panel of people here to discuss this issue, so let's go ahead and dive in. So we're gonna do this in sort of a talk show style, so I'm gonna introduce them briefly and have them each speak a little bit about their perspectives and issues. I'm gonna start with Dr. Lisa Wong, who is the director of the LA County Department of Mental Health, uh, where she's been a clinical and program leader for more than 30 years, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to her to, to give us some introductory comments. Okay, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm excited to talk about um, the state of reform, especially with all the exciting things going on in the behavioral health world. I think we've seen more focus on behavioral health than ever, and I think there are pluses and minuses to that. I think, um, you know, through the pandemic, um, I also, you know, all the growing homelessness, the litany of things that we have in the mental health arena, this is such an important time to look at where we are, where we've been, where what we need to get where we need to go. And I um, hope that we can have a really good discussion about that today. Terrific, thank you. Next we have Karen Spiegel, she's County Supervisor, Region 12, or Riverside County, or Region 2, Riverside County, as well as other roles, which I think you're gonna describe. I'm sure many of you wear many hats, but yes, I am Riverside County Supervisor, and I'm also the chair of IEHP, which is the Inland Empire Health Plan. So I have two roles when I'm talking. Some of them overlap and some of the needs and our uh, assessment, but then there's some separateness. The real issue, um, Riverside County is one of the largest counties, and I, excluding LA, shh. Um, <laughs> But we have some unique issues because we have geographical size. And San Bernardino is our partner in IEHP. So San Bernardino is the largest county in the nation, as well as California. And Riverside County is the fourth largest in the state. And the challenge we have is we have been the fastest growing county, Riverside, for decades. At least the last couple. And we have um, almost doubled in the last 25 years. So it tells you, um, and, and there's so much land east. As you know, everybody keeps going further east. The challenge is, is we have some very hard to reach places. And that's true with San Bernardino. So having the health plan hat on, that is one of our biggest issues, is the, the reaching out to those disadvantaged and those hard to reach communities. And then that adds, if people don't want to be there, neither do providers. So then we have the inability to give the best care that we'd like to be giving. So that's a whole different conversation. Um, but we have 21 public health um, care systems in Riverside County. And with that being said, we also experience such a shortage on being paid back. So our financial is all dependent on the monies that we get um, from the state and the feds. And on the average, 60% um, of patients in Medi-Cal are uninsured. Um, but some places, so I can't say we're the worse off, have 80%. Now imagine having that. We have such a large population of Medicare, Medi-Cal patients, and yet we can't get enough hospital beds, enough providers to meet it. Now one thing that IEHP has done is we started a foundation and giving scholarships out and those scholarships go with a commitment of five years. We have 168 students in the program or graduated in just the short five years that we've been going. So it tells you now we are putting in line, we addressed a problem and we created a way of trying to address it and fix it. So we do have some um, new providers coming in but you know, they won't meet the needs of some of the providers that are already in the system. Um, so we just, but you have to constantly replace yourself. And I don't know whether the pandemic helped or hurt. I think we have somebody <laughs> who may be able to share better than myself. Um, but when we're talking about, the, I guess it would be the finances, the hard to reach um, on both hats. So um, that's what I'm looking for is, is how others are addressing that. And because I know that we're not unique. Thank you, Karen, and we'll dive into those. Dr. Samir Amin is the Chief Medical Officer at LA Care Health Plan. If you'll go ahead and op open some comments and we'll dive in. 
Thank you so much. Well, it's really great to meet all of you, and hopefully I get a chance to say hello and shake all of your hands, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, I, I'll take a quick step back. I've actually had the opportunity throughout my career to be both on the provider group side as well as the health plan side in my clinical leadership career. I've also had the opportunity to be uh, in the Medicare Advantage space, in the Affordable Care Act space, and now mostly in the Medicaid space. And, and I would tell you that my biggest reflection, having that varied experience, is that there is a huge gap between healthcare policy and actual healthcare. And I think that's a lot of the conversation hopefully we're gonna have today. How do you, how do you get from a place where we're putting down policy and suggesting philosophically how patients should be treated on the ground in a clinic with a provider right in front of them to actually getting that work done operationally. And there's a huge gap between those two things. And we can see that uh, the state of California is right now in the midst of, I would say, a revolution in terms of how they're uh, putting down policy with CalAIM, as well as with a lot of the uh, interesting things that doing around population health management, transitions of care, uh, a lot of the all plan letters that are coming down the pike to really try to transform uh, Medi-Cal into much more of a managed care program. With that idea of having value-based care in Medi-Cal, we're faced with how do we actually implement that operationally? How do we get our providers ready for that? How do we get clinics set up to provide guideline-based, value-based care? How do we get into a place where we're actually able to deliver on transitions of care for these members? And that's on us as uh, people who are working in providers' offices, people who are working in health plans, to actually make that happen. So the big topic on my mind every day when I come to work is how do you move from philosophy to operational excellence to actually getting better care for, our, for members? And I think that uh, there's a big difference between saying you're gonna do something and actually doing it. You could not have expressed better what we're trying to do here today, right, is to bridge that bridge that gap, um, and I think the intent is often a universal. This is where we want to be. The goals are clear, but it's getting there that's really the challenge. Um, you've all mentioned several of those challenges. When you, when you step back, how do you see us moving forward in addressing those challenges? You talked about, Karen, about workforce. You talked about behavioral health, Lisa. What's, what's, our, what's the greatest challenge facing us right now, and what are some of those things that we really want to move forward in to address those challenges? How do we take it beyond the, here's our problem statement? I think that um, probably between uh, you know our managed care plans and our county behavioral health, we really demonstrate the need uh, to bring together the strategic and the tactical. I think that a lot of times with managed care plans, you know they have the funding, they have the infrastructure, they want to see how to get the best care to people. On the county side, as a direct provider, we are trying to provide our best care and we're trying to figure out what's the infrastructure to support that and how do we keep that funded. So really a lot of what our challenge is today is about bringing together the strategic and the tactical. And you know, I'm, I'm director now, but actually I'm a clinician at heart. Uh, I spent most of my career providing direct services. And even, even now I still do a lot of uh, street work with, with patients. Um, so I think one of the big things that always comes to mind for me is a huge challenge for our, our kind of safety net network is staffing. I think that, you know, all of us have seen sort of the staffing challenges, not just locally, but across the nation. There just are not enough mental health providers to go around. So how do we recruit staff to have the capacity to give people the treatment that they need? But also, what do we do to retain staff um, to, to help those who do the helping so that they can still be there with clients? Um, I think also, you know, we're looking at challenges in terms of a lack of historical investment in this system. Like, I think it's fantastic that right now there is this focus on behavioral health, but that hasn't been always the case. We are dealing right now with a system that has been traditionally underfunded and overlooked for many years. So the problems we have today, the challenges we have today, are not 
you know, things that came up overnight. So we've got to look for not just short-term solutions, but also sustainable and longer-term solutions to pull us out of, you know, the deficit we have. And, and I have to say maybe because this is Los Angeles County and homelessness is like so on the top of our priority list, I think another challenge to our safety net services is the conflation of homelessness with serious mental illness. I think the two are often treated as the same and they often are not. There are definitely huge overlaps, but we have to be very strategic and thoughtful in the way that we approach these two issues. Smear, can you, can you think of an example of that bridge that you were talking about where something is is on one side, it's on the policy side, and you're also seeing it on the tactical, on the implementation side. Yeah, um, so I would, taking a step back, I'll tell you that the answer to your first question about what is the thing that is ailing the safety net the most, I mean, I, I think all of you probably would have the first answer come to your head would be funding, right? It's, we're talking about, we're talking about Medi-Cal, we're underfunded, right? In my head, the, there's something that underlies that, right? And the underlying factor as to why the system needs more money is because of a lot of the administrative burden that has come down the pike. And so if we're asking people to do the same things that they were doing before, in the same way that they were doing it before, you can tack it to inflation and pay people the same amount of money and go ahead and, and fund it in the same way. But we're facing very different challenges now than we've had in the past, and we're being asked to do things in a different way. And in order to do them in a different way, we actually need to recognize how much administrative burden and how much transformation work actually needs to go into that. And so you're talking about you know, that bridge between healthcare and healthcare policy. We, we, I, I, in my opening comments, I mentioned some of the things around transitions of care, some of the things that are being asked around population health, some of the things that are being asked around uh, transformation to a value-based care system. That stuff can't happen for free, and it can't happen by accident, and it has to be intentional, it has to be strategic, and there needs to be investment in that process, and you gotta teach folks how to do that. That's not intuitive. It's not intuitive to move from a fee-for-service system uh, to one that pays based on uh, outcomes for patients. And so when I think of how do you bridge that gap and how do you fix that uh, how do you uh, make sure that the policy and the philosophy is actually getting into the provider's office? For me, that's helping with the administrative burden. In more than just money, that's tactically helping. That's bringing uh, different silos of the healthcare system together so that we can actually make that transformation. And I can, I, I'm happy to get more detailed about that, but I think when it comes down to it, uh, even when you're talking about field medicine and mental health, like it would be great if we had an actual system by which we could organize street medicine within our, our county, right? It's the ask to do street medicine is not the same thing as actually operationally figuring out how that happens and how you make sure that it's organized such that people aren't stepping on each other's toes. The ask of treating homelessness uh, or of uh, helping people um, get back into homes, get a stable place to live, that's a great ask, it's philosophically the right thing to do, but how you operationally do that without removing people from the ecosystem that they've developed on the street, that's difficult. It would be great if policy bridged that gap with us. So the, and I think there's a lot of examples that we could, we could pull to this, and I, again, we should definitely have a discussion more about how we get the, sort of marry the different silos within the healthcare system, health plans, providers, county facilities, uh, as well as the state itself to come together on how we're actually going to operationally do some of these things. Okay. Karen, did you want to add something to that? I think one of the big things is I'm one that's been advocating for the funding. It, it's, it's kind of scary when you think about it is we get federal funding and then it's supposed to be state match, state doesn't match, so now we're spending $2 to get $1 in return. And that's just basically at our county level. I don't know if anybody else experiences that, but it's been a real issue. But that is one that just is a mandate from the state, the feds, and we can go up and complain, we can scream, we can do whatever we want. But in the meantime, we have people who need us. And so we have to be innovative, we have to be collaborative. So working together, um, just like our homeless 
Uh, we have really done some great things in our homeless uh, communities. In fact, the state's been finally recognizing, Riverside County is not one of the favorite state uh, counties. So we do um, experience some of that challenge. But we're working very hard because we're doing the right thing. We're doing a lot of collaboration with IHP, with Riverside County. We don't work as a county and a health plan in silos, we work together. Then we pull in our nonprofits, we pull in every organization, we pull in as those that have a role in our outcome that we're looking for. And so when we partner, I think partnership is the most important part of any organization. And if we choose not to collaborate and partner, we won't be as successful as we could be. And what I'm talking about that is we just started um, we're breaking ground on our first wellness campus. And it's gonna be an all-inclusive campus that has mental health, public health. It's got, for homelessness, we've got for zero to 12 year old and then adults, we've got substance abuse. It's a campus providing all of the health issues, hopefully, to stabilize. But in addition to it, we have housing. So we're putting people in houses but giving them the full wraparound services because you, you have to do it all together or you won't have the outcome that will be lasting. And so I think the most important thing is to look outside the box, be innovative, um, still advocate for money. I mean, obviously, we need that. But don't get so fixated, because that's what we were doing for too long. We were so focused on you know, beating on the doors, saying you know, we're underfunded, we're underfunded. And that's because we have a model of funding for the counties that goes back to 1991. They kind of changed it, but I'll never forget five years ago when I went to my first supervisor training, they said, if you want to change the behavioral health fund, it's mainly behavioral health, then you need to get the other counties to shift some of their money. Now what county is going to give Riverside any money? <laughs> really? So that they have less and we have more? Because it really is, if you look at the funding, some counties have so much funding they don't spend it. And then there's other counties that are doing what we're supposed to be, we're growing, we're building, we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing, but the money's not following. So it's just learning to deal with that, but not be so consumed that you're missing the big picture where we need to be, and that is with dealing with our residents, whether they're immigrants, whether they're um, children, adults, seniors, veterans, whatever it is, we need to address everybody and everything, so we can't do that alone, we need to bring in partners. Just pulling a thread out of there, and I think this is similar to what you were saying, I, I worry that funding a system that is not organized, that is not aligned properly, the money is just gonna get swallowed whole. And we'll be asking for money to kingdom come. And we'll constantly be going back to the state saying we're underfunded. Um, and I, I just, I think that there, there has to be a moment at which we say, hey listen, we have to align our resources better. We need to make sure that we're organized in a way where the money is actually going to be effective. And we need, to, we need to actually get together and decide what we're going to do. We can't do everything all at once and well. And so when I talk about administrative burden, you know, I talk about all the quality metrics that are coming by, all of the penalties that are associated with it, um, all of the work that has to be done to you know, do a risk adjustment, to do uh, transitions of care, to do all these things. And so if we ask the system to do everything all at once, when it, there's not enough money in the system, and it's not organized properly, and there's just mandate after mandate after mandate, and the provider is being crushed by all of the paperwork that they have to do, there is no way that that system is going to be self-sustaining. And so we have to get to a space where we say, these are the couple things that we're going to do. We're going to do them really well. We're going to operationally set up the county in a way that it can actually deliver on it, and then we will find out how much money that takes and we'll fund it properly. But it starts really with what are we going to do? What do we really think is going to be meaningful for these populations? And number two, how are we going to organize around that effort? Everybody, providers, health plans, everybody. And then how, how much money is it going to cost to actually do that work and is it going to be funded properly? Right now, it, it's, it, I, I, my sense is that we're going in the, we're, we're attacking this problem in a different way, which is, here's the 500 things that we wish we could do. And it comes down from the state. Here's the 800 things that we ought to do to make the healthcare system perfect. And then, 
the system takes a look at that and says, well, in the, in the way that we're set up right now, that's going to cost $5 trillion. So can we please have $5 trillion? And then it turns into a negotiation with the state where the state's like, we don't have $5 trillion to give to you. But the actual question is, do you really want us to do all 800 of those things? How about we do five? And how about we do it really well? And then this is how much it's going to cost. It won't be five trillion, it may be five million. Can we get the five million? The state probably would come back and say, sure, here's your five million dollars. But it has to be a collaboration about what actually makes sense on the ground for our members and our patients. Yep. You got some resonance there. <laughs> do you have any comments about, about that? I guess, you know, what's been on my mind a lot lately is some of the legislation that's coming down the pike that I think really impacts our ability to focus not on 800 things, but on those five things that are the most important. And I, I think uh, specifically like SB 326 that's coming up, you know, where 30% of our MHSA dollars, are be, our service dollars, are being redirected to housing only. And I understand that housing is a priority and homelessness is a priority, but there are other priorities like serving our clients, getting the services out to them that they need. And I think that you know we struggle not just with the multitude of priorities that we're given responsibility for, we also struggle with the fact that we are not at the table to give our input you know, on what those priorities should be and what it looks like locally for the needs of, of the people who live in, you know, for, for me, for Los Angeles County, but San Bernardino County, Riverside County. I think that that's something that's really missing so that we can focus in on what is most meaningful to our, our people. And then to have the time to make significant change so that it's, okay, we're giving you these five priorities, then the next week you have these 10 more, and then the next week you have these 15 more, and just as you're making progress on the first five, then that doesn't benefit our residents at all. And so I think we do have to focus on what's going to be most meaningful, most impactful to those most vulnerable in, in our systems. Yeah, I think the word, well, wonderful, thank you. Uh, you know, I think the, the word I keep hearing is system, systemness um, and creating systems, right? And I do think that um, single points of, of action are often the most challenging because you make maybe some progress and then you backslide or you, you can't sustain multiple lines. Um, how do you feel the, the system this progress is working? What do you need to begin to build those systems? Karen, you talked about partnerships. Um, are there partnerships now for this kind of approach? What do we need to, to move this forward? You also need flexibility. And you're right, the seat of the table, we need to start getting that seat. And maybe we need to just be a little more firm on it because what's happening is we don't have the flexibility. Not only do we not get the, the funding and the resources, but then we don't have flexibility and it changes, like you were talking to 30%. And that's where we really have to go united and um, get the flexibility because you can get, stand something up, many of your top five priorities, and then things change again. And then you, you're, you're left, what do you do? Do you, do you continue to move forward and stand up whatever that, that support system that you're trying to stand up. And what's happening is, is at the same time, they're changing the quality measures, you're changing everything, and you don't have time to bring those numbers forward. And so there's not a correlation between the, the projects of the five that you've chosen, because each county is different. Our five will be different than the needs when we sit there and address each county because we have different needs. And as we're standing things up and the quality measures are being done every year, they change those measures, and then they, time we catch up, they're two or three years down. And that's the other system that, that they have, say they, the state, or even the feds, but it's mostly the state that we have the challenge with, is that not consistent and not working with us um, and being flexible. So the last couple of years, we have a little more flexibility with the funding, and now that we've gotten into a pattern, they want to change it again. And it's very hard because things take a while to turn. It's never immediate, and we have to have the opportunity to make that change. Otherwise, they move on to the next two or three things. Um, so, so it is all about getting that conversation at the table so that we can work together. And you can't put one paintbrush across all California. We need to work together 
and then have our identities because your needs um, for your area, wherever you're working, have a different need than say another area. As I said, hard to reach communities. Some counties don't have those. You know, we go, Riverside County goes from Orange County all the way to Blythe, so we go to Arizona. And that's very hard, you know, that long three hour drive between uh, points within the county. And that's true of San Bernardino and other areas in your county. There are also large geographic. But then you have LA that has large numbers. So that's what I'm saying is we all have different needs and different ways we need to address some of the same issues, but how we do it needs to have the flexibility. My sense of it is that we have to act as a system of care. And in my view, a system of care is not just the people who are delivering care on the ground here in LA County or in Riverside. It's, it includes our policymakers, it includes the state, it includes DHCS. I view them as our partners because there's no way that this is gonna work if we're standing alone. Uh, and it's not gonna work if we're just following orders. We need to be sitting together, making decisions together. Now, one major issue with that is the modality that we're currently sitting in, which is a modality of penalties and carrots and sticks. And as long as penalty, as long as we're gonna sort of do this by way of penalties removing money from the system, we're not gonna be successful. We should be sitting together and co-investing in the system. You know, LA Care has done this significantly with our uh, elevating the safety net programs. Uh, I know that IEHP has done this as well. Um, and I think that that's an example of how you put money back into the system. But it would be great if we were sitting at the table with a lot of the policymakers making policies together. And instead of driving quality and driving change through penalties, removing money from the system, uh, that instead we uh, had investments uh, to drive quality and to drive transformation. And if we co-invest, my sense is that we'll be working more uh, as a unified party as opposed to uh, sort of penalty screaming, penalty screaming, penalty screaming. Uh, that's, I love that descriptor. Um, uh, it feels a little bit like homework. Um, uh, time at my house. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, what a great vision for this. And I'm, I'm hoping throughout the, the breakouts today, we kind of take that forward, is what would it look like? What does this system look like and how do we come together on it? I think that would be terrific. I wanna turn a little bit to, um, to workforce issues, which we were mentioned um, in several of your opening comments. And so now we've been talking about the systems and the structures. Let's dive into the people who are delivering the care and services. Um, Across the country, we're seeing shortages. It's not universal. It's different um, when you talk about different provider types and different systems that they're working in. Um, as you're coming to that issue on a day-to-day -day basis, what are you seeing as the, as the biggest challenge? And what are you sort of working through as ways to address not just recruitment, but retention and workforce safety and other issues in that environment? Anything to add to those, to those issues? Yeah, it, it is, um, I think the first thing is about recruitment. You know, we lost a lot of people through, during the course of the pandemic. We lost a lot of our workforce. And so we have to rebuild that. And, you know, for example, um, I, I used to be the director of a clinic in Skid Row. And I, I had a recruitment one time and I had 59 candidates, 59 clinical candidates who chose Skid Row as their number one you know, choice for employment. Um, and I recently held a countywide recruitment for clinicians and I had 13 candidates. So that tells you a little, I mean, Skid Row is not for everybody, but we still have 59 and down to 13 countywide. Now we have made some um, strides, we've made some progress. We're at about a 200% increase in hiring from a, a year, a year and a half ago. Um, we recently even just hired over 40 people for our highest security street teams. So I think that the tide is turning, but I choose to see this as an opportunity too. I understand that a lot of people have made lifestyle choices you know, through the pandemic or whatever circumstances to do telehealth or to go into different fields or to just spend time with family. But this gives us the opportunity to find those urban missionaries out there, to find those people for whom this is their life work. 
You know, this is the thing that gets them up in the morning. And that's what we are finding. That's why, you know, we have a brand new recruitment campaign and it's called Do Worthwhile Work. We set up a website, dowhatworthwhilework.com, so that we could really highlight what some of the intrinsic rewards are, the existential rewards are for this work. But we know that's not enough. You know, people have to live in the real world. They have to support themselves. They have to support their families. So we've also paired that with other kinds of rewards, such as we have rolled out a huge number of stipend programs, loan repayments, um, field bonuses, so that you know certain kinds of high acuity assignments get a higher percentage of pay. Um, and I think that that has helped a lot in the recruitment. But in terms of retention, what we've done is we have really built up our system of training so that we have something to offer people to still grow. So you don't get stuck in this position and you become stagnant, but you grow, you have a cohort around you, you have a system of support around you. We've also done a lot that's focused on morale building. You know, we've had different kinds of retreats and things. And we've also tried to build in as much flexibility as we can. So Almost everybody has some opportunity for telework, but it's balanced by what the needs of that particular program are and, and what kind of job opportunity, I mean, job responsibility you have. Um, so, you know, we're constantly looking, though, for what we can do more to recruit, to retain, to help people grow, to help them really invest in our clients because. I think at the end of the day, you know, the clients that we serve have so many struggles in their lives. The last thing they need is to be with a clinician or case manager or somebody else who really doesn't want to be there, doesn't care what they are doing or is not well trained to do what they do. Our clients deserve the best and I think that is, you know, one of the ways that we can retain our, our staffing is help them be the best and they take pride in that. I totally agree with everything you said. I think that um, focusing on retention is, is critically important. Um, we have to find ways to incentivize, and we do incentives. We also do provider dinners to do round table, to talk, to engage. And this is with IHP, with that, that hat. Um, <laughs> and it's really important that um, our providers feel that we care that we listen, and we've taken some of their suggestions and some of the incentive programs that we've established have been under their um, suggestions. And I think people, all of us here in this room, we wanna feel valued, and that what we're doing um, is recognized. Um, sometimes we can't reward in payment as much as we'd like to, but we certainly can uh, do other things, and that's what you, same as you were saying, is be, be creative. And of course, as I said, some of the incentives or the um, ways that we're addressing is, is the scholarships and, and uh, different ways of bringing in new people. Because you're right, it's, it's a tough market because lots of people poach, particularly your private um, hospitals and your private clinics and your, your commercial, um, they pay more. And so it's really difficult to um, continue being a public agency and not have um, people start looking the other way because we can't give all that they want. So you have to make the environment one that they want to be in every day. So I second all that. That makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna bring up something slightly more controversial just because I feel like you know it's morning time, we ought to make sure everybody's <laughs> awake. So I, uh, I'll bring up something controversial. I, I think we gotta get out of the business of doing duplicative work. I think we, you know, a, Apart from the fact that there's certainly not enough people, not enough providers in the system uh, to do the work that needs to be done, and we talked about the 800 priorities that have come down, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done, uh, I think we've got to get out of the business of doing duplicative work. There are so many mandates that have come down uh, to every member of the healthcare society in the county, in all the various counties, that we're all struggling to do the same thing in a slightly different way, and we're stepping on each other's toes. And when we do that, we're fighting for the same resources, we're fighting for the same people, and we're creating an environment where uh, it is disorganized. And I'll tell you that even in my life, you know, my life experience, there's, you know, I'm, I'm a provider at heart, and I'm seeing patients, and the patient's like, hey, listen, 
I got a call from the health plan's care manager, got a call from the hospital's care manager, I got a call from my clinic's care manager, my PCP doesn't know any of these people, and is trying to figure out what the heck happened, uh, and then, by the way, I have a specialist who's actually driving my care. And so there, there's no amount of staffing on this planet that is going to allow for us to do the same thing five different times in five different ways. And we are going to be grabbing for the same resources. We're going to be honestly creating a lot of dissatisfaction with those people because they're all saying, hey, listen, I got three other people telling me that they, the grass is greener on the other side. Maybe I ought to go there. And, I, and, I, and, and that effort is just going to uh, create a system that is more broken than the one we have. And so the, the better, my sense as to what the better way to do this is to get out of the Duplication Act and to get more in the Coordination Act. To get out of um, doing the same thing twice but doing the same thing synergistically. And there's, there's a way to do that. And a lot of it starts from making sure that the mandates don't overlap the ask and that they are singular for every single member of the healthcare society here, that this person's gonna, th these people are gonna do this thing, they're gonna do it really well, these people are gonna do this section of it, these people are gonna do this section of it. You're not gonna step on each other's toes. And I think if the more that we talk to each other, the more hospitals talk with the SNFs, talk with the health plans, talk with the delegated provider groups, there is a route for which each of us can do this section that we are supposed to do really, really well. And I think that will cut down on the need to fight for resources because at the end of the day, whether the case manager is employed by the hospital or employed by the provider group or employed by the health plan, it doesn't honestly matter as long as the care is conducive to that patient's health and is coordinated with the rest of the system. So out of the, the duplication world and into perhaps the more coordination world. And I've had this conversation, by the way, with DHCS, and they agree. So I think we're on the route to, uh, to getting this repaired. I think, though, this is where, again, we meet sort of the, you know, where strategy and tactical approaches have to come together. Because I think definitely as a strategy, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we can't, none of us can afford to be, you know, duplicating what anything is done. I think where the rubber meets the road, though, is how well this is actually coordinated. Because when we talk about, okay, this group can do this well, this group can do this well, this group can do this well, if it's well coordinated, that is fantastic. We are leveraging our resources to the max. But if we're not coordinating well, we just gave a client three more opportunities to fall through the cracks. And I think that when you listen to the experiences of a lot of our consumers, that's what they're telling us is that ideally we have a system set up to meet needs, but practically they're often falling between the cracks because we're not coordinating well enough. And I think that's going to be our challenge. And, yeah, go ahead. and I think that there, the interesting thing, and I completely agree with what you're saying, I, I think the interesting thing is the state and policymakers have stepped in in other spaces to provide that umbrella and to organize the system. Like I can think, you know, there, there are a number of places where there's been some degree of regulation. The regulation has been towards everybody needs to be on the same platform. Everybody needs to be using the same uh, infrastructure. And that's the mandate, as opposed to the mandate that, you know, uh, you need a case manager to call 15 times five different ways with five different uh, parties. I, I think the, if we can get the policy to be more around this is the infrastructure that everybody's gonna use and we're not gonna use five different types of EHRs. They're all gonna communicate with each other. We're gonna use the same uh, you know, way of doing a point of care tool to get the gaps taken care of. Like there are other ways to do this where we can think differently and we can actually have the state work with us on developing one infrastructure for everybody. And I think that'll be much more conducive to coordination than a system that's based on penalty, based on mandate, based on saying, hey, listen, we want to get in involved with the patient-doctor experience in a very specific way, and this is the law, and you have to follow it. And the level of measurement, which I think you've brought up a number of times about where are the metrics applied, where, who's responsible for them. I think moving those up a couple levels helps, helps with that as well. 
So um, we're going to turn to audience questions in a minute, but I have one more for you all, um, and we have a few more minutes, and we will be back on time. Um, so I wanted to, to ask you all if you had an example of where you've seen either progress towards what you've been describing or what's next for you. What are you going to tackle next in terms of what you see on the horizon for the safety net? What's your, what's your next goal? I'm going to start with you, Lisa. What are you looking at next? That's hard it's a long to list. Is it, is it 800 <laughs> things? It's a, very, it's a very long <laughs> list of 800 things. Um, you know, we have so many priorities that we, we're aligning with um, our county leadership. You know, everybody knows this around homelessness, around jail depopulation, uh, you know, all these very important things. But I think one of the areas where I feel we've made actually some progress is aligning in terms of our healthcare partnerships. You know, healthcare partnerships have kind of been a buzzword. Um, and as we navigate this growing population of need, I think that uh, we have worked more with our healthcare partners, with our managed care plans, and we are moving in a really good direction in terms of coordinating care and determining how we build a system where there's actually no wrong door. Because I think if we're going to serve our population well, that has to be the approach. It has to be a very as seamless as possible so that people do feel like there's no wrong door. You know, oftentimes people don't know when the exact moment is that they should get mental health treatment. So some get it early, some get it very late, and we want them to know that, you know, at whatever time you come to this realization that we as a system of care are here for you. So I think that um, our, you know, alignment with our healthcare partners has, has been really wonderful. I think where we need some work is alignment in terms of, you know, especially we've been working a lot with um, depopulating our jails. And we've been finding there that there is a lot of uh, lack of coordination in terms of the people who serve our clients in the jail, the people who have to take care of aftercare, the judicial system, all those things, we have to bring that into alignment so that becomes um, a seamless system of care too. We have too many people who cycle through um, incarceration and come back out, don't get the care they need and cycle right back in. So um, I think that's an area where we need to really work. When we talk about alignment um, at our UHS within the county, we've looked at alignment in four systems. You have your medical center, you have your community health centers, you have behavior health, and we have public health. And we've aligned the four working together um, and integrate within all of them. So when you're talking about knocking down the silos, that's where we find what's working. With, with our UHS, particularly during pandemic. And I think it was a forced time in our lives to have to look at everything differently because the needs were still there and how were we going to not be overwhelmed and be able to meet the needs of healthcare. Um, and that was a, a trying time but a learning time because it was um, excruciating at moments. Um, but keeping that alignment and focusing on the whole person and so that we're not all over the place with one patient, like you were talking about the different calls. And you have to look at the whole person um, in the picture and being able to integrate services, um, working for the end result, what's best. And I think that saves the time, it saves the money. Um, and that's what we found um, as far as uh, a benefit of working as a system than as individual parts of the system. And I'll pick up from there. I think one of the, the places where I'm most proud of how the system has acted together is with the MCO tax. And this just came down at, at LA Care, uh, sort of championed this idea that we needed to improve uh, reimbursements into the, into the safety net. And hospitals, health plans, uh, providers all got together and went to the state and said, hey, listen, we need more money in the system. These provider reimbursements need to be higher. Uh, and they were able to actually get significant action in a relatively short period of time because they came together as a system of care as opposed to multiple parties uh, sort of coming after their own resources for themselves. Uh, and so that's going to be a big meaningful change. We're going to get some increased provider reimbursements. I think that's going to help. If we could do the same thing around uh, administrative burden on our providers, 
I think we will be able to make another huge change in how the safety net functions. Um, and I can see that with additional wraparound care that we could deliver, but more so than anything else, streamlining a lot of the regulation that's gone into the system to allow for our providers to be able to breathe uh, and allow for us to retain providers in the system. Great, thank you. I'm actually gonna grab the moderator's prerogative and um, make an opportunity for questions and, and dialogue throughout the day rather than doing that here since we have such a, a crowded room and a crowded agenda with, with some more sessions. So will you please join me in thanking our panelists for their, for their time.